the, the outline is on page 14. The power of love. 1 Corinthians 13. This is not on. No, it's not on your book. 1 Corinthians 13. One to thirteen. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding gong clanging symbol. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries, all knowledge, I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. I give all I possess to the poor, surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But when there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be still. Where there is knowledge, they will pass away. But we know in part, and we prophesy apart. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, thought like a child, reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. But uh, then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, uh, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. If you were to uh, outline the chapter, chapter uh, verses 1 through 3 talks about the importance of love, why love is important, and then Four through seven talks about the characteristics of love, attributes of love, and then eight to twelve talks about maturity of love, and then verse thirteen of, of course talks about the permanence of love, the importance, characteristics, maturity, and permanence. Then you, have, you understand how Paul is describing what love is in this chapter. Uh, what is love? You know, uh, great question. A lot of question there. But uh, if you look at the outline tonight, we'll answer five questions about love because without love, we have no power. We have no power. So when we talk about the kingdom of God, uh, there's a part in Luke that it says, kingdom of God is within your heart. It says that. So kingdom starts uh, within our hearts. And we're talking about uh, how we can expand God's kingdom to tomorrow through our service. But uh, uh, today, we'll talk about how we can expand God's kingdom within our hearts. Two kinds of kingdom within our hearts. Uh, kingdom of our own self me kingdom, as we talked about yesterday, and uh, God's kingdom, kingdom of Christ within our hearts. Adam's DNA, Adam's territory in our hearts, and Jesus' territory in our hearts. Adam, even there's kingdom. War in this world, but kingdom war starts within our hearts as well. So uh, we need to fight to expand God's kingdom within us. That means we're fighting our own hearts for love. So uh, we'll this is it? Oh, uh, my not? It's supposed to be. Well, is there five questions? Well, that's, I guess it's not there. But if you look at the outline here, uh, five questions. First of all, what is love? Secondly, why is love so important? Third question is, what does love look like? Fourth question, what does love measure in a person? What does love tell about a person? And then fifthly, how? How do I love? We'll answer these five questions as we look into this chapter. I'm sure you've heard this sermon on this chapter many times in hundred weddings, you know, Everybody talks about this chapter. Uh, but we'll talk about it from the perspective of the kingdom and perspective of our own heart, exactly our own heart. So 
first of all, what is love? That's the first question. To know what is love, the question is what is what it is not exactly what it is and what does it mean to what does it mean to have love? We'll talk about that a little bit. First of all, we gotta think about what it is not. World thinks that love is feeling, emotion. So for example, uh, when beautiful girl walks by, a guy goes, whoa, I'm in love. What does it mean? Oh, I feel like going to her and talking to her and interact with her. But the problem is, another girl passes by and you like her a little bit better than her. They go, whoa, a little bit louder. Whoa, I'm in love, right? <laughs> a little bit of uh, you know, emphasis there. But the, the, then, I'm not in love with this person, I'm in love with this person. I think what he's saying is, now I feel like my emotion feelings go to this person and then talk to this person. So love is emotion and feelings according to what we, how we should usually use it. But the problem is, I don't think that's the definition of love in the Bible. Because it says love your enemies, same word, love your enemies. Same word for love your spouse, love your wife, says love your enemies. Whoa, you know, what does that mean? Do you ever feel like going to your enemy and love that person? Do you ever feel like going to your enemy and hold that person's hands? So it must not be emotion or feeling. I mean, love, and, love is related to emotion, related feeling, but it's not equated to emotion and feeling because often, even the most loving person, you don't feel like loving that person, but you still do. Often, even Jesus, when we uh, have, when we love Jesus, often we don't feel like it, right? Because there's two natures fighting, and uh, sometimes a sin nature operates, and we don't feel like going to that person, right? So, uh, love may must be related to emotion, but ne not necessarily emotion. If we're always moved by emotion, Saint Augustine, one of my favorite books ever, called Confession, you know, Saint Augustine's Confession, he said. He talks about love, he says, he was not loving others. He says, I was in love with love. That's what he said, I was in love with love. He was basically saying, I was in love with what love gives me. That's what being moved by emotion and feeling is always like. Though you don't feel like it, right? Sometimes there is true love that is less, uh, no emotion. Emotion, less love, out of commitment. There's desire. Right? Desire to love the other person, though you don't feel like it, but you go, I love Jesus. I'm going to love that person with the power that God gives me, and you love. So uh, love is related to emotion, but not always feeling. Then what is love? I believe according to 1 Corinthians 13, here's incredible insight. Chapter 13, 1 Corinthians 13 is between chapter 12 and chapter 14. What is then, what is chapter 12 and chapter, chapter 12 and chapter 14 are about spiritual gifts. In the Corinthian churches, they were all doing all kinds of gifts, incredible manifestation of the Holy Spirit, and there, were, there was a lot of pride involved because some gifts looked greater than others, so they were proud, they, were, they thought they were better than others, and there was a lot of fighting, arguing in the church. So Paul is going, without chapter 13, which is love, which I believe is a motive of the heart, so chapter 12 and chapter 14 is are about what you're doing, what you're capable of. Chapter 13 is the reason why or who you're doing it for. It's talking about the motive of the heart. Love is the motive of the heart. And two natures, again, two natures, two kingdoms in our hearts. All of our motive on this side, Adam's side, is we're doing it for our own self. Selfishness. Adam's DNA, right? me, right? you eat me. You do everything for me. Uh, you know, it's, it's about your own glory. It's related to your selfishness. But there's another nature that is reborn when we are, when the spiritual resurrection takes place in Jesus Christ. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, another nature is born. Another bodies of desires are within you for Christ, for others. Though you feel like, you don't feel like doing it because you don't get anything from it, you still do it out of love for Christ, for His glory. And two motives always fighting within our hearts, two natures. So love is the motive of our heart. And we always have dual, door motive, double motive, constantly battling. So we need to constantly think about the right reason so that 
right desire can be stimulated to do it so that we do it out of love for Christ and love for other people. And then you look at uh, verse 1 through 3. It says, then what does it mean is when it says tongues of men and angels, but have not love? Have not. What does it mean to have love? So you're like, I have iPhone. I don't have iPhone. It, it seems like uh, it's some kind of material when it says have, but it's semantics. Have not love means because our hearts have two motives, it's talking about the condition of our heart. At this moment, am I operating on motive of love or motive of self-love, right? That's battling. So have love means at this moment, what am I thinking? Am I doing it out of love for Jesus Christ? So if I'm operating predominantly on the motive for Christ, that means I have love. So love is like a condition of our heart. So for example, uh, you know, it, it, this chapter talks about faith, hope, and love as, you know, similar things, right? Faith, hope, and love. Different, but uh, faith, hope, and love is also a condition of our heart. So let me illustrate it with faith. So Jesus uh, was walking on water, and disciples were in the boat, and Jesus was walking in the storm, and Peter goes, Lord, if it's you, let me walk on water. I, if I was Peter, I, was, I would have said, Lord, if it's you, let Judas walk on water or something like that. I don't want to take a chance, right? But he says, let me walk on water. Incredible faith. So Jesus says, come. So Peter is able to walk on water. You know why Peter is able to walk on water? Because Jesus said, come. It's, there is power to his word. And he puts faith in his word and faith in Jesus. So condition of his heart at this moment is faith, faith, faith. Or as he's looking at Jesus, he's walking on water. And then what does he do? He looks at the winds and the waves. Right? When he looks at the winds and the waves, he goes, he remembers what his science teacher said, right? So between density, you know, all these things. Science teacher versus Jesus. He believes in the words of science teachers more. No faith, no faith going in the water. Faith, 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 no faith. Two natures, two minds, two kinds of condition of our heart. Always faith, no faith. Hope, hopeless. Love, selfishness. Always battling. So when it says, you have love, you, it's talking about the condition of our heart. At this moment, are you loving mm, with the motive of your heart? So we have to constantly think through and fight for our motive. Why am I doing this? Who am I doing it for? Am I doing it out of love or am I doing it to get something out of it for my own self and my own glory? So what this passage is saying, unless you are operating on love, you have no power. Your gifts, exercising of your gift, whatever you do, your capability, your ability means nothing unless there is love. It's like a, uh, love is uh, uh, exercising your ability with love is like a shot, like a medical shot. You know, some of you are probably in the med med medical field and there are some nurses. What's important when you give a shot? Right place is important, right? So there are some nurses who cannot find the vein, like pushing you 10 times. Where is it? <laughs> Uh, more important than the placement of the shot, right? More important than the placement of shot is the content of the shot and the medicine in the shot, right? So if you put place in the right place, but no medicine, nothing, there is no power, no healing. I think love is like that. It's like a chapter 12, chapter 14 are like, you know, placement of the shot, right? And then chapter 13 is like a medicine in the shot. Shh, sound again. Shh. You press it, medicine goes into the right place in the vein, then there's healing. Same thing, no matter what you do, where you do, how you serve, unless you're operating on love, there is no power with what you're doing. Okay, so uh, always operate, always fight for right motive. Hmm? So because when you do operate, when you do any, anything, everything out of motive of love, then there is power. Uh, you know, so it's not related to emotion, it's not related to feeling, it's not related to what Hollywood teaches us. Uh, probably the most closest thing uh, to true love is probably mother's love. So I, I remember, uh, you know, writing about a mom's day, I wrote about moms. And this is what I wrote in, in, in my Facebook. This is what it says. Why your mom's body will break down when she gets old. None of the moms here looks like their body's breaking down though right now. <laughs> this is what I wrote. Her womb will break down for carrying you in the deepest part of herself for months. Breast for losing large portion of her bodily liquid to feed you for months. 
arms for carrying you day and night for years. She could not say no every time you cried or demanded to be held. Legs, just a number of times she went to groceries and carry them will be the cause of her having arthritis later, if not already. Lips for repeating things. Did you eat? Study. Eat your vegetables. Don't swallow the Lego piece. Stomach for eating too little because you wanted more, eating too much to eat your leftover. Eyes for her tears will wear down her eyelids because your sadness, your joy, your presence, your absence were the cause of her ceaseless tears. Eyes again for blocking her vision. You were always in front of whatever she was seeing after your birth. You were never out of her sight. Heart for missing you and for always wanting you more of your love. That's a little bit more like what love is. Uh, the world says love is shown in the hand that holds the rose. But God says love is shown in the hands that were nailed to the cross. Uh, don't learn what love is from Hollywood. We got to learn what love is from Jerusalem. And uh, love is the motive of the heart. And this love, no one in the world, nothing in the world knows. It's a foreign love, alien love that comes from Jesus Christ. So first of all, we talked about what love is. Secondly, uh, let's talk about uh, why is love so important. And I believe verse 1, 2, 3 talks about importance of love. We'll talk about this. Why is love so important? Uh, first reason is three things here for 1, 2, 3. I can, I can pray for nothing. You cannot pray unless you have love. You pray out of love. First Corinthians 13, verse 1, it, it says, If I speak in the tongues of men and then of angels... Uh, but have not love. If the word tongue comes out, then it becomes theological debate. Right? But when uh, Paul talks about speaking in tongue, he's not talking about you know, theological debate. He's just basically primarily thinking about prayer. Proof of that, when you look at verse 2, chapter 14, verse 2, it says, if anyone who, uh, speaks in tongue, he does not, he's not speaking to men, but to God. So he's thinking about prayer. Right? So going back to verse 1, then he's saying, if I, pray, if I pray in tongue, if I pray but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. So prayer is useless without love. Let's go. Uh, also, uh, another reason is he says, I am nothing is used in verse 2. If I speak the gift of prophecy, again, it becomes a theological debate. What is prophecy? Is, is it inside about the future, inside about a person? Is it foretelling of the future? Or is it, is, you know, explanation of the scripture? There's all kinds of debate about prophecy. But Paul is basically thinking uh, about words you use to others so that you can edify the other person, ministry to the other person. So again, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 4, it says, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. He's thinking about pray. If you pray, you, you receive God's grace and blessings. But he says in verse 4, he who prophesies, meaning using the words, no matter how you define prophecy, using the words to minister to other people, it edifies the church. So going back to verse 2, then what he's saying is, if you use the words to minister to other people, yet you have no love in your heart. You're not doing it out of motivation of love. Uh, you are nothing. It's useless. Uh, third importance in, is in verse 3. I gain nothing, he says. Uh, if I, verse 3, if I gave all I possess to the poor. Wow, this is pretty powerful, isn't it? Hmm? So many people give, help the poor, especially uh, in, you know, movement of social justice. If I give all I possess to the poor. And he even says, surrender my body to the flames. That means you can die for somebody without love. You can actually give your life without love. You can do it for yourself because it's a, maybe you think it's the right thing to do. You do it to be glorified. I don't know. But you can actually do this and give help to the poor and, and die for others, yet have not love. He says, I gain nothing. Now, when he says, I gain nothing, does it mean, is it talking about fruit? Or is it talking about reward from heaven uh, on the judgment day? Possibly both. So if you put these things together, why is love important? Because 
If you, without love, you cannot pray, then you cannot receive power and grace from the Lord. Without love, you cannot minister to other people. There's no effectiveness to your ministry. Without love, there's no fruit. There's no reward after your life. Basically, Christian life means nothing uh, without the right motive, right intention in your heart, without love. So Christian life means nothing uh, without love. God looks at your heart, amen? God looks at your heart. Not only what you're doing, but really what the motive of your heart. And that's what this passage is saying. So without love, there is no power. Here's a picture of, I don't know if you know, but I have five children. Uh, this is my number five. Joshua, Daniel, Ruth, Hannah, Sarah. Sometimes you, get, you have five children, you get confused, the names. So I just call them one, two, three, four, five. <laughs> this is number five. Uh, there's, I have two boys, three girls, and uh, she's number five. And three girls, I give them nickname. One of them is charming, one of them is pretty. This was unique. <laughs> and she likes, oh, I like that. <laughs> she likes, so she likes unique. She's unique. Uh, even her gifts, when she gives me things, other guys give me some useful things like toothbrush or something like that, something useful. She gives me things like this in the next picture. I have no idea what this is. <laughs> And she gives me, Daddy, this is for you. And, and, you know, I used to ask, oh, what is it? And she goes, you mean you don't know what it is? She gets upset, so I can't even ask what it is. So now I have, uh, now I know what to do. When she gives me things like that, I, don't know, I have no idea what it is. Then I go, oh, thank you. <laughs> I just stay silent. Then she goes out, then I just put it in the drawer because I don't know what to do with this. Right? I don't even know what it is. So she gives me this. Same thing she gives me, so I said, oh, thank you. And routine, she goes out, and I'm about to put it in the drawer, but this time she comes back. And then she goes, Daddy, this is with all my heart. <laughs> so I still don't even know what it is. <laughs> but this useless picture became something so important because she said, she coiled this Useless thing with love. Suddenly it became such a powerful thing, useful thing. I, can't, I show it all over the world, <laughs> what this, meant to, this, this means to me. And that's what love does. Love gives power to whatever useless thing that we're doing. Love gives power to it. Think about God. God, I don't know, some of you might not like it, but God does not need anything. God is absolutely self-sufficient. God owns everything. That means whatever we can do for him, we think we can do for him, it's pretty useless to him. <laughs> so whatever we do, what he wants is not what we do for him, but what we do for him. He wants, what he wants is not our money, our service, what we can do for him, not even our time. What he wants is us. He wants us to love him through these things. And when we love, he will use it. There's power to everything we do if we do it out of love. Let's go to the third point, third thing. Third question is, what does love look like? Uh, we need to examine our hearts through this. What does love look like? Now, when he describes his characteristics of love in verses 4 to 7, he does it with two is's. First of all, two is. Love is patient. Love is kind. And then there are eight knots of love. Keep going. Eight knots, right? two is eight knots. Uh, it does not envy, it does not boast. And then thirdly, there is four alwayses of love. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. So two is, is eight knots, eight, or four always, he describes what love is. Paul describes what love is. And you understand that he's personifying the word love. Basically, he's basically he's saying loving person. He's, he's describing, picturing what loving person look like. So, uh, you know, we describe it like this. When, when a guy likes a girl and girl talks to her friend about this guy, she goes, oh, what is he like? What is he like? Oh, he is tall. He's not very handsome, but he always smiles. Right? Is not always, we kind of describe another person like that. And that's what, we're, what Paul is doing when he talks about love. Loving person, he's picturing a loving person. Loving person is, is like this, two is this. Loving person is not, right? Eight nots and loving person always, 
four oases, he's describing a loving person. Uh, we cannot describe every de everything in detail, but I'm going to talk about maybe three or four things, three things or something like that, to examine whether our motive is right before God or not. And we'll do that tomorrow morning too, when we serve, tomorrow morning when we talk about serving, is our motive right before the Lord. Now, first, first thing is, let's examine the first one, love is patient. Love is patient. Now, it says love is patient, it doesn't say patient, uh, loving person is always patient, it doesn't always say, when you're patient, you're loving. It, just because you're patient always, it doesn't mean you're loving. For example, tall kid and a small kid fighting, right? Uh, tall kid comes to a small kid and slaps his face. Small kid goes, hmm, love is patient. Uh, that's not love, is right? Because that's self-love. If he's not patient, he'll get killed. So he, he has to be patient in that situation. So love is patient, but just because you're patient is not always loving. But how about opposite is true when the small kid comes to the big kid and he slaps the big kid's hand, uh, uh, face. Now, big kid can, of course, beat him right away, but he goes, whoa, love is patient, and he's patient. Now, there in that situation, that's loving. Even though he does not lose anything by reacting in anger, he's still patient. Maybe he talks to him, makes sure he doesn't do it anymore, or something. Uh, so when he's patient, he's loving. So what this passage is saying is, is, saying is when you're always consistently patient, right? whether you lose things or whether you gain things, uh, you know, where you, when you're consistently patient out of love for Christ and love for the other person, then that is loving, consistency of that character. Uh, another word that we want to talk about is love keeps no record of wrongs. Uh, and end of verse 5, it keeps no record of wrongs. Now, what does it mean? You know, Peter came to Jesus, and Peter says, Lord, how many times should I forgive? And usually in Jewish culture, you forgive about three times. And then he goes, up to seven times he thought he was going to receive praise from Jesus. Wow, you're better than me, or something like that. But uh, Jesus goes, no, 70 times seven. 70 times 7, you know, he was a fisherman, so he couldn't calculate. So probably a couple hours later, he came back. Jesus, that's like 409 times. What does that mean? I think what Jesus meant was, don't keep the record of wrongs. We keep the record of wrongs, don't we? Like when somebody does something, we don't hear it, but there's thing, we count. Second time, thing. Third time, thing. So first time he does, it's okay. Second time he repeats, something comes up. Third time happens, something's going to fly to the other person because we keep the record of wrongs. I think what he's saying is, no, if they are repentant, you need to forgive. Uh, don't keep the record of wrongs. In fact, this word, in Greek word, is one word. Okay, one word. And in Paul's system, you have to understand how he uses this word in other episodes, especially in Romans, this word is used for uh, God's justification for us. God's justification means we are justified in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven in Jesus Christ forever. So we can go to him again and again and again and again and again and again and again. How many times have you repented of your sins in your life? I'm older, so I probably did a lot more than you. Right? How many times have you asked for forgiveness? He, you can go to him again and again and again because the Bible says God does not count the record of our wrongs because we are justified in Jesus Christ. So uh, don't count the record of wrongs because that's the love God has for us. In fact, what this passage is saying is when you are receiving God's forgiveness, therefore, out of that love, you are able to forgive the other person. What you're doing is you are transferring, showing God's forgiving grace to the other person in such a way it becomes a powerful ministry to, to the other person. So when you are able to forgive, you're not just forgiving the other person. You are ministering God's love to the other person. There's powerful ministry of delivering God's love, forgiving love to that person so that that person would want to repent and receive forgiveness of God. So we need to forgive uh, in our hearts. Uh, <clears throat> there's powerful uh, effect in this culture where we really, uh, you know, 
really speak for the victims. I think that's wonderful, that's great. And uh, we really point out the victimizers. And then, uh, you know, uh, we take care of the victims well. But what's, what we're forgetting is, victims are not just weak people according to the Bible. As they're healed, it takes time as they're healed, they become powerful people in such a way, if, they, if God can empower them so much that they can show the love of Jesus Christ through their forgiveness. So I believe, uh, you know, uh, we need to be balanced in that way. Hmm? And, you know, uh, the people who have been offended, uh, as I said yeah, last night, we are all sinner means we are all both victims and victimizers in our lives. So we always need to be forgiven. And as we take time, I know some, some people have gone through some drastic stuff that we can know. It takes time. But in due time, as you receive God's power, you can powerfully show the powerful, forgiving love of Jesus Christ through you as God empowers you. Uh, another word that I would like to uh, talk about is the word trust. I don't like this word. I don't like this word in uh, uh, this chapter. <laughs> it's bad to say I don't like a word in the Bible, but uh, I didn't like it. Look at this word, verse 7. It always protects, always trusts. It sounds like, because I speak to a lot of women who, uh, you know, uh, you know those, those ladies that you, everybody's talking to this lady, and sh she likes a guy, and everybody's saying no. No, all of our girlfriends are saying no. All of our spiritual leaders are saying no, no, you, uh, uh, you know, maybe not or something like that. And she goes, no, he's good, he's fine. He seems like some gullible person, right, uh, who, uh, you know, just trusts without uh, her brain. So I used to not like that verse because it's, uh, it seems like love always trusts sounds like you're so gullible, you're stupid. You're not really able to think. But I don't think that's what this passage is saying, right? After ministering to people, I've been in the same church for 30 years, 10 years, 20th year. If you minister 20 years, you learn some things that you don't learn in first 10 years. Now we're finishing about 30 years. If you do 30 years, you don't learn in 10 years, 20 years, you learn something in 30 years. And you see a lot of people, all kinds of people. I'm sure I hurt so many people in my lifetime. And in ministry, so many people hurt me. Uh, and I uh, started to understand what this verse is saying, love always trusts. So when you do ministry for 30 years, things, thousands of people, you see a person, you go, after a while, after a little bit, and you kind of know whether that person is trustworthy or not, right? And you know you shouldn't trust. You know, you, you know there's something about a person you cannot trust. But if you're a pastor, you still trust. Not because that person is trustworthy, not because that person may not hurt you, that person may hurt you, but you still trust because, so that that person can grow. Even though that person may stab you in the back, even though that person may hurt you, you still trust uh, because sometimes it's okay to get hurt. It's okay to be stabbed. Because we step Jesus so many times, and he still loves us. With the power and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we can still keep going. So spiritual minister, pastor, spiritual leaders are the ones with scars. Not wounds, right? Wounds hurt, but after a while, it becomes scars. So there's memory of the past pain, right? Memory of past pain, but you're healed. It's not, you don't have pain anymore. You have memory. But it's okay. Sometimes people stab you too. <laughs> keep going. You know? Keep loving people. Keep trusting people. Keep ministering to people. I know some people, after they get hurt, they cut off relationships. Now, you, you can distance your relationship once in a while. You can, you, you, even if you reconcile, relationship may not be completely equal or same anymore. Sometimes that happens. But we still have to forgive. We still love. Because when we uh, can still trust and love people with scars, we are a lot like our Savior who still loves us, who strengthens us, empowers us, empowers us. So with tears, I learned to trust people, you know, knowing uh, that 
even though they can hurt me, I'm st I can still love them. So we trust not because we are weak in these situations. We trust because we are strong. We are stronger than our pain. And we can go through it with the love of Jesus Christ. Ah, and love will help us to always persevere. So let us examine our hearts, you know, with a lot of pain, a lot of things in the past. But take some time. God can strengthen us. God can heal us. God can even enable us not only to forgive, but all the way, go all the way out to love. Love them in our lifetime. Uh, let's go to the fourth point, which is, uh, what does love tell about a person? This passage puzzled me the most. You know, out of all the verses, when you come to this passage, I suddenly, uh, when you're talking about love, and then suddenly it comp compares perfection and imperfection. What does that have to do with love? And then it measures man and a child. What does that have to love? I couldn't understand it for a while until I started to, uh, uh, you know, study Paul's epistles and Paul's system. As I said before, Paul is describing a loving person, so he's thinking about a person, right? Especially when, uh, you know, you understand what Paul is doing in chapter 12, 13, 14. He's describing the body, church, body of what? Body of Jesus Christ. So I believe he's thinking about Jesus as the most loving and perfect person. Meaning, if you are able to overcome your selfishness, repent of your selfishness, and still be able to love from being imperfect, you're being perfect. If you are able to fight your heart and still love, you are not a child. You are becoming a man. You are becoming an adult. In fact, if you are more and more loving in your hearts, you're becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. You're becoming perfect. You're becoming uh, grown up, uh, men and women of God. Mm. So we need to fight in our hearts, continuously fight in our hearts so that we can love. Because if you don't fight in your hearts, you fight other people. <laughs> if you can overcome your heart, you, you can love other people. So we got to learn to fight in our hearts so that we can love others love is an active force uh, and paul paul is personifying jesus and more we more we fight in our hearts more and more we become like jesus christ let me ask you i grew up in a church immigrant church that fought like that separated about four times maybe some of you have uh grown up in that kind of church you know what i'm talking about i, I i'm gonna I'm going to say, I'm not even going to say what kind of ethnic church, obvious, it's obvious, but I'm not going to say what kind of ethnic church I grew up in. But group, they fought, I mean, some people fighting in the church with chairs, knives. I've, I've seen those things in the church of Jesus Christ. Uh, and then I, I was looking at that, I'm going like this, oh my goodness. Separated four times. I still thank those churches because still I'm a product of, those immigrant churches. They were imperfect, they were bad, but I still uh, owe uh, part of my growth as a Christian to those churches. So I'm thankful. They were doing as best as they could. Mm. But I remember being in the, those churches and realized something. Let me ask you, may, maybe you grew up in uh, hurting churches, bad churches, difficult churches, fighting churches, churches that separated like me. You know why there are problems in the church of Jesus Christ? Let me put it this way, because there are too many kids in the church of Jesus Christ. Too many children. I'm not talking about your kids. I'm talking about spiritual little children who can't overcome their selfishness and cannot love. I pray that this church will be full of grown-ups, men and women of God, who will be able to overcome their selfishness and love. Amen? Amen. If this church is full of adults, you might have to close the door. <laughs> Who wouldn't want to join a group of people like that? If, if people come into your church, can they experience the love? Can they experience the love through your faces? If your heart is so full of love, you, you do like this. Hi. Shh. Do you smile? Do you, do you have reputation of being friendly? 
Supernatural friendly, supernatural smile, supernatural hellos. Immediately when people come in, I pray that they'll experience the love of Jesus Christ through many adults, many grown-ups in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Nobody wants to come to a church that is filled with me people. No. But people would want to come to church if you are spiritual grown-ups, spiritual leaders that will take care of people, love people, that just, just, just cares about them, you know, and takes care of them. And we need to invite them, embrace them, uh, as Jesus does for his people. There was an 80-year-old boy who had a sister, older sister, who needed a blood transfusion. So doctor comes, and obviously he had the same blood type. So doctor and the mom, mom comes to the boy and goes, can you give your blood to your sister? He, is, he gets so scared, he's trembling in his lips. It took about two minutes or something like that, and he goes, okay. So they do a simple operation, gives blood transfusion to his sister, and success, it was very successful. So the boy was sitting down in a chair, and doctor comes in to says to the boy, boy, are you okay? He goes, I'm okay. But can I ask you a question? Doctor goes, sure. The boy goes, when do I die? So he thought giving blood meant he dies, she lives. So he was sitting there thinking about it for two minutes. And then he said, yes. Uh, simple thing is, he did a simple thing for his sister. But in his heart, he was dying for her. I think that's what Christians should be like. You know, first, you know what 1 John 3.16 says? I, I know it sounds hardcore, but I'm just reciting the Bible. Right? Bible verse. <laughs> you sinners. No, no, no. Uh, if you were here yesterday, it's an inside thing. 1 John 3.16, this is what it says. This is what love is. That Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And then he says, we ought to lay down our lives for one another. That's what he says. The difference between the organization in the world and the church of Jesus Christ is we should be willing to die for one another. I know that's hardcore, that's a high I'm just reciting a Bible verse. We should have that kind of attitude in our hearts, that kind of commitment for one another out of love for Christ. And then out of that love, just like that boy, just the simple things for one another. If we have that kind of love and the simple things to one another, they are spiritual beings. They would experience the love of Jesus Christ through us. I think that's what this passage is saying. Let's pray that we'll be full, filled with God's love. So that as we do simple things out of genuine love for Christ, that they would experience the love of Jesus Christ through us. Amen? Amen? Amen. amen. I know it's hard to say amen to that, but let's at least go progress towards that direction. Uh, let's go to the, I'm just talking about how to grow this church. <laughs> uh, people, you know, people filled with that kind of, a church that's filled with that kind of people would grow. It's not about what we do. It's not about, it's not about uh, what we say. It's about who we become in Christ. It will just come out through what we say, what we do, everything. And uh, through the love of Jesus Christ. How do I love? Last, last question here. Fifth question. How do I love? Let's be practical. We'll talk about heart, mind, action, and repentance and faith. Heart means we actually have to know that we have capability to love. Because some people will say, I can love anybody except my boss. I can love anybody except my father. I've heard people like that. Now, understand that understandable especially when you experience some things in your life but theologically that's wrong <laughs> because we have dna of jesus christ we have sin nature but we also have dna of jesus christ so we need to fight it might take some time but eventually by by god's grace we can love anybody because we have capability of spiritual nature that is connected to the Holy Spirit that is enabled by the Holy Spirit. So it is possible. It may take time for some of you and do take time.
but eventually you'll be able to love. We have capability to love in our hearts. Second thing there is mind. We need to be intentionally even thinking about right things. Right? Sometimes we can think about hammer. <laughs> when you think about somebody, <laughs> hammer. Uh, or you can think about the cross. Wow, when I was an enemy, Jesus Christ loved me. So you can think about each thing. You can think about all the past, what that person has done. Or you can, then what it does, is it, it stimulates our sinful desires, sinful nature. You want to hate them, you can't forgive them. But as you overcome those things, wrestle through, digest it, but you think about the cross of Jesus Christ, love of Jesus Christ that enables you, then your spiritual nature is stimulated. Right? So you can, uh, you are able to love. So what you think about will stimulate one uh, or the other nature, one desire or the other desire. So what we think about is very important so that our condition of our heart can be that of loving. Third, action. We just got to do it. Nike principle, just do it. Because uh, you don't feel like it, but if you do it, as you do it, you'll be able to do it better. You'll be able to do it easier. Your heart will follow your actions often. Let me ask you, if I say love your enemies, think about the worst enemy that you have, whoever enemy is. It might be your spouse at this moment. It might be your kids. You know, uh, It might be somebody. But if I say love your enemies, does it feel like, wow, are you motivated? Or does it feel like a burden? Does it feel like empowerment or does it feel like burden? But uh, let me say this. You know, Lazarus, Lazarus was dead for four days, right? And then Jesus comes to the grave, and Jesus goes, Lazarus, come out. Come forth. Can you imagine Lazarus lying down and go, Jesus, I'm dead. Your command to come out is a burden to me. <laughs> Can you imagine him saying this? No. Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. His power, his word goes through his ear. Brain starts to work. He hears, and then hearts start to pump. Hearts start to pump because God's word is power to us. God's command is burden to us in our sin nature. We become legalistic if we don't take it with right motive in our heart's empowerment. But if we take the word of God through our spiritual nature and we take it and go, God, empower me, strengthen me to do it. As you do it, it will become your power. You'll be able to do it out of love for Christ. Heart, mind, action, just do it. Last thing is, here we go, repentance and faith. Uh, we need to persevere in doing it. Uh, love is patient. Love is kind. Instead of love, let me ask you to put your name in place of love. Two exercises we're going to do. One exercise is, instead of love, put your name. So for me, it's like Min. My name is Min, right? Pastor Min. But Min, Min is patient. Min is kind. I cannot do that anymore. <laughs> oh, it. There's so many memories that come to my mind, so, so much pain. If my wife hears that love is, men is patient, men is, she would want to throw up, right? <laughs> so, no I, I, no, I can't do that. But instead of your name, uh, let's put Jesus. Jesus is patient, Jesus is kind, Jesus is not envy, Jesus is not boast. You can almost rap through these verses. <laughs> and that's the thing, when you see yourself when you compare yourself to the mirror of the word, you go, Lord, I'm sorry, we got to repent. We are so lack, lacking, we are so deficient, we repent. But when we think about Jesus, who has done all these things in our behalf, he is our righteousness, then we, we have faith. Jesus, help me to become like this. I'm sorry, repentance and faith, repentance and faith. Key to spiritual, a constant repentance and faith. He will strengthen us, empower us, so that we can love others. And in the midst of that, imperfect will become perfect. Uh, child will grow up to be a man and woman of God, will become like Jesus Christ. He will help us. I don't know if you know this song called, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? It's an old song. So old people going like, there's some remakes by some other people. Or remakes of all kinds of songs. James Taylor and Carol King sings this song called, Will you still love me tomorrow? Beautiful song. Let me read the lyric. It says, tonight your mind completely, you give your love so sweetly. Tonight light of love is in your eyes. But 
Will you love me tomorrow? Is this a lasting treasure or just a moment's pleasure? Can I believe the magic in your eyes? But will you still love me tomorrow? Sounds so beautiful, right? Basically, let me exegete what the song is about. Here's a boy and a girl, and boy wants her for the night. And she's uh, asking this question, oh, tonight your mind completely, you give your love so sweetly. Tonight light of your love is in your eyes. But will you still love me tomorrow? <laughs> Again, second verse, is this lasting treasure or just a moment's pleasure? Can I believe the magic in your eyes? Will you still love me tomorrow? You know, when I uh, uh, officiate wedding, I don't go, do you love her? No, question is, will you love her? Mm. Uh, because marriage is not about confession of present love. Marriage is promise of future love. No matter what she looks like, no matter what he looks like, because wedding day is most deceptive day, right? They ain't gonna look like that anymore. <laughs> Even the next morning, they, gonna, they ain't gonna look like that anymore. Okay? Uh, but we confess our future love. No matter how many tomorrows will be there, I will still love you tomorrow. No matter what happens, no matter what you do, I am committed to you. You will be my love every tomorrow for the rest of eternity, rest of our life. Because love without future commitment uh, is like a series of one night stand, except a little longer in duration, which will end in due time. We need, when you get married, you're going, I will love you every tomorrow, rest of my life. I say things like this. I know it's like drastic. Some people don't like it, but I like it. I, I say this, things like this, you know? You, most people curse you by saying, oh, I pray that on a wedding day, I pray that today will be the best day of your life. I go, what a curse. That means tomorrow will be worse, next day will be worse. And I bless them by saying, as great as today is, I pray that today will be the worst day of the rest of your life. And tomorrow you love each other more. And every day you love each other more for the glory of Jesus Christ. And that's what love is. Not only in marriage, same word is used for our love for one another, love for the world. We need to have same kind of love. Different than marriage, of course, but same kind of love for others. Uh, our church is multi-ethnic church. You know, 50% uh, Korean-American, second and third generation. The rest is 30 ethnic group in our church. Uh, so we don't use Korean language at all, just like probably like this church. But I use a couple words, few words, because there's no word to describe it in English. One word that I teach is the word called jak sarang. Jak sarang. Jak sarang means one-sided. Jak means one-sided, one-directional. Sarang means love. So one-sided, one-directional love. So when a Boy likes a girl, but girl does not like the boy at all, is jak sarang. When the boy comes to the girl and goes, I prayed about it, and I believe that God wants you to be the mother of my children, or something like that. <laughs> and the lady goes, if you are the only boy that exists in this world, I'll marry the tree. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's jak sarang. Some people are not laughing. <laughs> that's jak sarang. And one time I was counseling this lady who was in Jaksarang, you know? And every year I go, you still have feeling for him, feeling for him? Yeah, for seven years. I know it's so painful for me too. <laughs> seven years she goes, you still, yeah. And then I was just crying for her in the car. I was coming back home, I was crying in the car. And then it dawned on me. I was so, I was weeping after this thought because if you were to, if, we, if I were to summarize the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation, if I were to use one word to describe what the Bible is, summary of the Bible, I would say jaksarang, one-sided, one-directional love. God loves us. God created us. God loves us constantly. We sin. We run away. We love other things. We are idolatrous. But He chases after us again and again and again. He loves us. He sends His Son. He loves us. He sends His people. 
And then we say, Lord, I don't want to love you. If you are the only God that exists in this world, I'll worship that tree. That's what human being was like throughout history. Yet God still loves us again and again in Jesus Christ. And he loves us with one-sided, one-directional love, chasing after us. Though we fail so many times, though I fail so many times, he still loved us. He still loves us. For he will do that in Christ. Every tomorrow, rest of history, he will constantly love us. And you know, let me say this. Key to marriage is jaksara. I'm talking about from your side. Doesn't matter what your spouse does, you keep on loving her. Doesn't matter what he does, you keep on loving her. Doesn't matter what she does, you keep on loving her. Because every fight is about, why don't you love me as I love you? That's a, that's a fight. But if, we, if you are to constantly love each other no matter what, you can have happy marriage. You can go through any problems in your life. Key to marriage, key to ministry is jaksarang. Just keep on loving with the love of Jesus Christ. Last picture. This is the... This was actually me. As she was 22. I was one month away from 23, almost 23. We got married right after college. We went to Korea and visited prayer mountains. And we're in Jeju Island. We're taking this picture. 1987, we got married. Uh, we've been married 30, what is it, 1987? So is it 32? 32? Okay. Engineering major? <laughs> Accountant? Okay. 32 years I've been married. And, uh, this was, I don't know, maybe 24th year or something like that. I was away on a wedding uh, anniversary, so I wrote this in, in a Facebook. You know, I'm 1.5 Korean-American, right? Uh, I'm Korean and American. <laughs> and so, you know, usually American culture is you say all the positive things. In Korean culture, you say all the negative things about your marriage. In American culture, all you say is all the positive things about marriage. So I'm like balance. You know, I'm more realistic. In you know, American culture, you say, oh, it was the best 32 years of my life. Korean culture, it was terrible, but, you know, we just lived together, you know, that kind of thing. Like that. <laughs> so I'm realistic here, okay? Korean-American. This is what I wrote on our 24th anniversary. You can see how romantic I am. This is it. This is what it says. It's hard to love a sinner. I recover. It's hard to love a sinner as a sinner. Many highs and lows through thick and thin. Only because his love is greater than our flaws. After 24 years, she is still the love of my life. And that's a realistic picture of marriage. Two sinners. We're so selfish. We fought. But she, jaksarang. I sometimes jaksarang. A lot less than her. <laughs> but we still keep going. So many mistakes are made. We still keep going. Because that's the love of Jesus Christ for us. Key to marriage, key to ministry is jaksarang. By his grace, you can love. And I pray that this will, church will grow with the people who are grown-ups, people who are like Jesus, people who are more progressing to be perfect in Jesus Christ. Uh, let's pray. You need to repent if right now, if right now is not the moment you love Jesus the most, then you need to repent. You need revival. If our goal is more than yesterday, we need to love Jesus today. More than today, you need to love Jesus tomorrow. More than tomorrow, you need to love Jesus two days later, every day more, so that the day we die, 
will be the day we love Jesus the most. That's the key to marriage. I pray that today will be the day that you love your spouse the most. Tomorrow more than today. As we love Jesus more, we can do it. Same thing with people surrounding us, spiritual ministers, leaders, love others, grow in love for others. If we love Jesus more today, more than yesterday, we can do it. He will help us. Oh, so let's examine our hearts. Your wounds have to become scars. And when it becomes scars, though you have memory of the past pain, you can have present love that will lead you future empowerment to love your spouse, love others, love your enemies, love your coworkers, so that they can see and experience Jesus through you. Okay, keep praying. Let's until the prayer and praise is less tonight. Let's pray.